Hi everyone, this is Mrs H Psychology, um, short video on uh, gender identity disorder, GID, and this is for AQA Psychology, paper three, the gender topic, and we're going to cover here biological explanations. So an introduction to GID, part one, biological explanations, and there will be a part two on social explanations. So if we have a look at what is needed for the specification. Okay, so the um, spec says atypical gender development, so for you to cover gender identity disorder, biological and social explanations. Now the key word here is development, this word development. So we need to think about this as atypical psychological development, not to be confused with atypical biological chromosomes patterns, chromosome patterns, which are covered separately. Okay, so this is referring to GID, gender identity disorder, so any question on um, gender development is going to be referring to this. Atypical uh, chromosome patterns, Turner syndrome, Kleinfelter syndrome will come under atypical patterns, biological patterns. Right, just so you know, there's some references for you if you need them for the different textbooks that we use and I'm going to refer to or I've, I've got my information from. So what do we mean by GID? GID is gender identity disorder. The DSM-5 classifies it as a condition where individuals experience a mismatch between their biological sex and the sex they feel they are. Now this has been seen on a sample paper and a mark scheme, so I would recommend that you learn that definition. What is GID? It's this. Okay? Gender dysphoria, same sort of thing, it's all part of this GID. The dysphoria is the major symptom of gender identity disorder, and that's characterized by feelings of extreme anxiety, uncertainty, or being persistently uncomfortable, persistently uncomfortable about your assigned gender i.e. what's um, based on your anatomical sex. Um, in case we need the diagnostic criteria, again at the moment it's not absolutely certain um, until we see some past questions, but I've put it in here just because you know I, I think you've, you need to know it as well. So a marked difference between a person's expressed gender and, and how others would see them, this has to uh, recur for over six months and it must be causing significant distress and or impairment, for example, in social functioning. In children, the desire to be the other gender must be present and it must have been verbalized. Okay, so explaining GID. Remember, even though GID comes under psychological development, there still may be, and it seems very likely that there is a biological or there are biological causes. So we need to be able to explain and evaluate biological and social causes. Right, um, just so you're aware, from summer uh, 2017, the exam paper, the actual exam, question 14 was this, discuss what psychological research has told us about atypical gender development for 16 marks. Some students were a little bit confused. They had just had a question on atypical chromosome patterns. This was specifically about GID. Okay, so when it's talking about gender development, they're going to be referring to GID. Okay, for my guys, you know that the green are referring, uh, the green highlighted pages referring to the revision booklet, and um, the red ones are referring to extension material. Okay, so you've got some references there. So the biological view covers various theories. It talks about um, a genetic possibility, i.e., that people might inherit this dys dysphoria, a hormonal possibility. All right, we've got some info um, further down, and also that there may be the possibility that there are structural differences in the brains of people. For example, in the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis, okay, abbreviated to this. Useful for you to actually be able to name this. I know it's a bit of a mouthful and you're not familiar with it, but try to learn that if you can, okay, rather than just abbreviating. And then once you've used it, obviously you can abbreviate. So biological explanations use different methods. We've got post-mortems and you've already studied that in year one, post-mortem studies, uh, which will look at structural differences in the brains once somebody has died. So in other words, somebody um, with GID and comparing it with somebody, uh, a post-mortem on somebody who hasn't, hadn't had GID. They also look at twin studies to look at the heritability and you've also got gene profiling down there. So I'm going to take each of these in a little bit more detail. Um, so we'll look at structural differences first. 
So brain sex theory or brain sex research focuses on what we call the dimorphic areas of the brain. In other words, the areas that take a different form in males and females. And they suggest that this dysphoria is caused by very specific brain structures that don't match with their biological sex. In other words, you know, there are differences between um, somebody who's, who's biologically male, let's say, and a specific part of the brain which may look or be the size of, etc., etc., a, um, a typical female. Okay, so we'll have a look at some evidence for that. Um, we use, for example, postmortems, and they, as I've already said, and they will confirm these structural differences. Okay, once the person has deceased. So let's have a look at the evidence. Um, right, so we've got Zoo, first of all, studied the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis um, in postmortems and found that around 40% were larger in males than females. And in postmortems of six male to female transgender individuals who had already received feminizing hormones, the BSTC was found to be a similar size to a heterosexual woman. Okay, so these were males who didn't feel like they should be male, they felt like they should be female. And in postmortems, six of them actually had a BSTC, which was a similar size to what we would call a typical heterosexual woman. Okay, so the argument here is that it's part that part of the brain which is telling them that they should be female. This is supported by Kruver, um, who focused on the number of the, instead of the volume of the BSTC, focused this time on the number of neurons in the BSTC. And again, in six transgender individuals, they showed a similar number of neurons to those found in heterosexual women. Okay, so this time it wasn't the volume, it's the number of neurons. And they concluded that BSTC provides evidence for a neurobiological basis and proposed that that was already determined before they were born. We've also got Swab, who compared postmortems of 17 individuals who had undergone gender reassignment against 25 controls who had not had a gender reassignment. And they found a particular area of the hypothalamus, actually it's called the hypothalamic un uncinated nucleus area, was similar in size to the female control group in the male to female gender re reassignment participants. And in the one female to male, it was similar in size to the males. So once again, evidence showing that the particular part of the brain, a particular part of the brain may be telling um, that individual that they are in the wrong sex, okay, that, that the part of the brain is developed according to the different sex. So we've got that for our structural differences. Let's have a look at genetic differences now. Genetic differences looking at twin studies, Okay, we've got dizygotic and we've got monozygotic. Just a reminder, monozygotic, really worth you putting in any exam answer here. MZ twins are from the same egg that is split, so they have 100% the same genetic makeup, whereas dizygotic, um, fraternal, non-identical, these are just two eggs that happen to be in the womb at the same time. All right, So they're, they're, formed, they're, they're just the same genetic makeup as siblings. Okay, so what evidence have we got? For example, hair compared gene samples from male gender dysphorics and non dysphorics, and they found a correlation between the gender dysphoria and a specific gene called the androgen receptor gene. And that implies that this gene is involved in a failure to masculinize the brain during development. If you remember, we all start off in the female form, but in the, in the first trimester, I think it is, the, um, the male uh, hormones should trigger a response. So that, so that the brain starts to be masculinized in the womb. And the idea being that by the time an infant is born, its, its brain is already, um, th this argument is that its brain is already shaped into being a male brain. Um, and that's their argument, okay? So it could possibly be something here, uh, a gene which is causing um, this, this dysphoria. Coolidge assessed 157 twin pairs, 96 of them MZ and 61 DZ, for evidence of gender identity disorder. And they used clinical diagnosis from the DSM-4. 62% of these cases were said to be accounted for by this genetic variance. And again, that suggests that there is a strong 
heritable in, in other words that you've inherited you know some sort of difference here a strong heritable component to gid we've also got halens who compared 23 mz twins with 21 dz where at least one of well where one of the uh, of each pair i should say was diagnosed with gid and they found that nine of the mz twins were concordant meaning matching all right their behaviors were matching for gid compared to none of the dz and again, that indicates a role for genetic factors. And then a final little bit on hormones. There is more that you could do, but you have plenty of evidence here. This suggests that there are differences in the release of hormones. For example, in this first trimester, the third month of pregnancy, where typically testosterone is released and should start to develop the male fetus's brain differently to the typical female's brain. And this suggests, this theory suggests that this process doesn't occur typically as it should. So you've got plenty of evidence here. You don't need all of this, but um, you know you will need a, a minimum of, I would say, at least one of each of those areas, um, and for for a pass. But obviously, the more you can um, learn um, in total, the the higher you've got access to those higher levels. Don't try and learn all of this. Plan it so you've got um, some evidence to present for it but also we're now going on to the evaluation so evaluating this biological explanation you need an absolute minimum three and obviously once again there's plenty of material here choose some that you like to try to learn for higher levels higher grades given that you may be asked a 16 marker okay so let me whiz through these so we've got evidence against it if you like so Zucker for example performed a longitudinal study on gender dysphoric females between two and three years old and then again when they're 18 so over a long period of time longitudinal study only 12 percent had that dysphoria at 18 and an equivalent study on males with dysphoria dysphoria sorry found only 20 percent continuity and this supports the idea that the majority of people actually do change over time and they don't continue with their dysphoria over time However, Hines argues that people who do experience this dysphoria, which persists, face such emotional and psychological hardships that it can't be just a social thing. It's got to be a much more fundamental. It's got to be a biological cause for these people who do persist. Um, it does appear that a biological cause is likely, but we would argue it can't be the sole factor. You know, if we look at MZ twins who have 100% same uh, genetic makeup, and yet we've got such low concordance rates for them, like, for example, Halen's 39% for these MZ twins, then other factors have to be involved. And this is where you could bring in your nature and nurture. Okay, and we can develop that a little bit more, but obviously that's good to try and bring those in too. Also, it's very difficult to tease out the relative influence of nature and nurture with twin studies. And we should throw in that term interactionism, that we have the two interacting all right, nothing is straightforward in the nature nor nurture. Um, twins, especially MZ twins, are probably going to influence each other. And their environmental conditions are really very, very similar, especially when you compare them with DZ and so on and so forth. Also, due to the fact that GID occurs so rarely, um, sample sizes are very small. And obviously with that, that means we have a problem generalizing to the whole population. Is it that there's something... It's actually very different in them already. Is there something else that's going on? Another confounding variable that we haven't spotted. Um, geared research, obviously, here's where you can throw in socially sensitive area, ethics. We need to be very careful about confidentiality, protection from harm. This is really personal and very sensitive area for people to discuss. People get... Um, naturally quite emotional um, talking about this as, as a topic and so we need to be very very sensitive to this if any research is going on. Uh, we also have contradictory evidence for the BSTC so for example it's claimed that the BSTC is fully formed by five and any hormone treatment that they may have as part of their gender reassignment shouldn't have an effect on that BSTC but this has been challenged and alternative research, for example, by Paul et al. as one example, has found that transgender hormone therapy did affect the size of the BSTC. And that means that the brain differences found in transgender people from postmortems 
could be the result of that therapy. And that kind of discredits this theory that the differences in BSTC causes GID. Biological explanations criticised for being reductionist and oversimplistic. And again, if we're bringing in our issues and debates, we, um, you know, this is quite good high level stuff that we're explaining it, um, saying that it's reductionist, it reduces these very complex behaviours to very simple genetic, neuroanatomical or even hormonal um, explanations. And the problem with that is that there are probably other contributions from higher psychological or social levels which aren't really being taken into consideration. And, you know, it's likely that an interaction actionist combination of all of these things is actually a better explanation for it. And then we go on to social, which will be in part two. So just to recap, you've got plenty of evidence for it, plenty of evidence against it. Be careful, you don't need all of these. You select, I would say that you really need for a 16 marker, you're trying to aim a maximum really at eight points that you can fully expand on, you can really develop. So we want some support for it, we need evidence against it, but more importantly that you can really explain. So select, if there's something there that you don't like or you find really difficult to understand, just leave it, move on to another point, find some points that you can develop that you're happy with. Okay, and then I'll um, deal with the social in part two.